Welcome from the studios of KPBS-TV in San Diego, California. We are reaching you live through a unique and complex international telecommunications network via satellite, microwave, and cable. The International Training Center at San Diego State University brings us all together in this video conference, which joins distinguished organizations located in Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Costa Rica, Panama and Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil and Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina, the United States of America, and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva, Switzerland. We would like to send a special greeting to our distinguished ambassadors, high-level officials, and friends gathered today at the OAS in Washington, D.C. Welcome to our program on spirituality, health, and well-being, implications for our future workforce. This is the eighth video conference of the series Competitive Success with a global focus. My name is Daniel Hopwood, and I will be your moderator for today's program. I am a senior consultant with the International Insurance Brokerage and management consulting firm of J&H Marsh and McLennan, concentrating in the areas of occupational safety and health and business continuity planning. Today's program is composed of two presentation modules and two question and answer sessions. We look forward to your live participation. What is evident as we look forward to the next millennium is that our workforces will require leadership, innovation, and continuous effort to improve their health, well-being, and spirituality. What may be most important is that these efforts will mandate the integration of these three elements to be successful. Success in this integration will result in a workforce that is healthier, happier, and more productive. As you will learn, there are both individual and organizational aspects to achieving long-term well-being. Although we are discussing spirituality, well-being, and health from a global, innovative, and practical perspective, it is essential that we recognize the role and value of the biomedical approach to health. Earlier programs have highlighted the integration of Western medicine and the alternative methods of achieving well-being. It is equally important to recognize that the concepts and practices reviewed are equally important in the occupational setting, understanding the theories and utilizing the principles across social and organizational boundaries will help us reap many benefits. Direct and indirect benefits are derived from improving the health of our workforce, and you will find that the subjective measure of happiness is nonetheless critical to encourage, develop, and maintain. Most cultures have found that the integration of positive, non-work activities can contribute greatly to an individual's happiness. Today's presenters will help clarify how to move from working on an individual's happiness and well-being to that of an organization. It is a pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers, Dr. Patricia Geist and Ms. Linda Poindexter. Dr. Geist is a professor in the School of Communication here at San Diego State University. She has over 20 years of experience as an educator, researcher, and speaker, as well as an author. Dr. Geist has been on the faculties of the University of Hawaii, the University of Hartford, Purdue University, and the University of Northern Iowa. In addition, Dr. Geist has received the Outstanding Faculty Award at San Diego State, both in 1992 and 1997 has received the Fujio Matsuda Fellow at the University of Hawaii and has been a faculty fellow at Hawaii and the University of Hartford. Dr. Geist has co-authored two books, has a text in progress, and has authored or co-authored more than a dozen journal articles, 15 chapters in a variety of texts, and has contributed to nearly 50 competitively selected papers and panels. Much of Dr. Guy's research and education activities have concentrated on communication and the process of communicating in social and work groups, with many of these efforts focused on health and well-being. Ms. Poindexter has spent more than 30 years in a variety of positions with the Southern California Gas Company. Most recently, her duties and expertise have been as the company's regional wellness coordinator. Ms. Poindexter has studied at both Pierce College and the California State University at Northridge, located near Los Angeles, California. In her capacity as the wellness coordinator, Ms. Poindexter combines her own holistically derived life principles with education and wellness activities at the Southern California Gas Company. 
Her efforts have had an impact on the lives of more than 1,100 of her fellow employees and have included such activities as events as on-site health screenings, creation of the company's subsidy program for health clubs, crisis counseling after an earthquake, and an ongoing education program for employees on various health and wellness topics. Welcome, Dr. Geist and Ms. Poindexter. And I'd like to begin this morning with an introductory question. We recognize that improving the health of a workforce is important, and such improvement can be translated into increased production capabilities. In today's conference, we are discussing the integration, if you will, of health, well-being, and spirituality. What role do you see spirituality playing as we look forward to workforces of the next millennium. Dr. Geis, would you begin for us today, please? Yeah, that is such an important question because every time people hear the word spirituality, the first thing they think of is their own organized religion. And I think the important point to emphasize here is when we speak of spirituality, we're really talking about the way in which we communicate with each other on a daily basis. And so the emphasis isn't so much on organizing spirituality in our corporations today, but instead to take a careful look at the, at the way in which we communicate with each other. Great, thank you. Ms. Poindexter, can you uh, add to that as well? Thank you. It's been my experience that when we start to blend a lot of the um, more basic issues that connect all of us, that heart connection, that what happens is there's um, more of a an appreciation of each other, a team spirit, the production is uh, definitely impacted in a positive way because there's more cooperation. It's a wonderfully extensive uh, way of being able to bring people together on a different level. Excellent. Thank you both for those answers. They were great. Now let's move on to Module 1, in which Dr. Geis will discuss concepts of wellness, implications for our current and future workforces, and the importance of including a spiritual base in our plans for the future. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. In his 1994 book, The Age of Paradox, Charles Handy suggests that so many of our good intentions in organizations have unintended consequences that result in difficult contradictions or paradoxes. In today's organization, disenchantment and alienation are clearly negative consequences of the social and economic crises faced by many nations. And no matter what organizations try to do, in the face of these crises, sickness of the soul is a prevalent experience for the employee who is distressed by downsizing, right-sizing, merging, and reorganizing. So among the many paradoxes faced by organizations, the health of employees continues to be a perplexing and challenging dilemma. Now, on the one hand, more and more organizations are spending considerable time and money developing and conducting programs for improving the health status of workers. We have programs like stress management, smoking cessation, coping with alcoholism, weight re reduction, and a wide variety of others. But on the other hand, while some employees truly do benefit from such programs, other employees believe that organizations are violating their privacy and that the boundaries between their personal and professional lives should not be crossed. Employees often feel pressured by these well-intended programs to be molded into the kind of employee that the organization desires. And still too often, these programs do not always address the alienation, the disenchantment, and the sickness of the soul employees are suffering from. Yet as Charles Handy points out, we must do more than label this a paradox. He suggests 
that we must find ways to make sense of the paradox by allowing the past and the future to coexist in the present. Now let me explain. We may understand this health paradox more completely if we consider the identity crisis that more and more employees are experiencing. In the past, workaholism was an expected norm. Actually, it still is in many companies. Today and in the future, more and more employees, including myself, are trying to recover from workaholism. Our dis-ease in organizations is our own workaholism. And now that the health conscious Generation X employees occupy 50% of the global workforce, wellness takes center stage. Conflicts of interest may ensue if the established workers do not agree with the health and wellness interests of these Generation X employees. Now most of us, of all generations, are coming to terms with our dis-ease. This is our discomfort with the powerful influence that organizations have over our definitions of who we are, what we do, and our sense of self-worth and self-esteem, our identities. We are all searching for other means of identifying ourselves, maybe as a gardener, as a rock climber, maybe an activist, or maybe an explorer, you name it. What is your passion? In addition, many employees are recovering from an individualism by discovering other responsibilities outside of themselves. This could be their responsibilities to people and to causes other than their job or their work. They are realizing that they have a responsibility to the planet, and some are becoming activists for environmental issues. Let me give you an example. United Kingdom-based company, The Body Shop, a retail firm offering hair and skin care preparations, educates and encourages both its employees and consumers to be activists for the environment. The company encourages consumers to recycle containers by selling their products in one container and then filling that same container over and over again. Now more and more employees are also realizing that they have a responsibility to their neighborhoods, with many becoming activists for community issues, volunteering their time. Now let me give you another example. The international consulting firm, Anderson Consulting, has actually budgeted administrative and training funds to support the community. Voluntarily, each employee is allowed to spend about two hours a week of chargeable time by participating in community activities. Employees are also realizing that they have a responsibility to each other. They are becoming activists for what we might call caring issues. And here's another example. I read a story in an issue of Newsweek about two months ago where it told about a New York banker who resigned from his three-figure position to move in with and care for his father who was dying from cancer. Now that his father has passed away, he can honestly say, that he lived his priorities, that caring for his father was a priority he could not afford to miss out on. Now these transformations have led some organizations to address the paradox of health in the workforce through de the development of what is being called a compact. The compact is an agreement wherein the organization commits to support the full development of each employee. And in return, the employee commits to being loyal to the organization. However, constructing a compact remains vague and abstract 
unless we consider the answers to two important questions. First, what contributes to employees' dis-ease? And second, how can we best define health for employees in the workforce now and in the future? Although the conditions which may be contributing to employees' dis-ease vary from one organization to another, generally unhealthy work conditions include the following. First, authoritarian supervision. Second, severe restrictions on employees' ability to actually utilize the company's resources. Three, production systems that limit employees' opportunities to contribute ideas and their own knowledge. Fourth, limited opportunities for the employee to influence the planning or the organization of the tasks that they actually perform. Fifth, tasks that deprive the employee of the ability to select work methods and the speed at which he or she will work. And finally, six, tasks that limit human contact. Over and over, research indicates that organizational structures and working conditions that deny employees the opportunity to participate in decision making while also requiring a high level of performance actually contribute to employee depression, irritability, and anxiety. This is a prevalent contradiction in today's organizations. Now research also indicates that during stressful situation the body actually secretes large amounts of epinephrine and cortisol which can actually suppress the immune system, upset glucose metabolism, and produce a multitude of other harmful effects. Companies often then are really working at cross purposes when on the one hand they offer programs which they believe will enhance the health of employees and thus reduce the number of health insurance claims but paradoxically at the same time they do nothing to change the working conditions or the organizational culture which can inherently be stressful. Now several ethical questions can be raised from this. These are questions that you can ask about your own organizations. First, do organizations intentionally reward unhealthy but productive behavior as a way of maximizing employee output? Two, as a manager in a company that rewards workaholic behavior, how would you counteract the problem? What questions would you ask? Who in the company would you consult? And three, as an employee in a company that rewards workaholic behavior, what can you do to address this problem? For yourself or for your coworkers? Who could you discuss this with? Anyone? And do you feel empowered or motivated to address this issue? Too often, we don't know the answers to these questions. Or worse yet, we don't even consider asking these questions. Clearly, what all of this reveals is the need to reconsider our definition of health and wellness. We must embrace a definition of health that balances concern for biological survival with concerns of personal, social, societal, and spiritual well-being. Within this definition of health, then, is a movement to include biography with biology. Employees' biographies include ruptures at work and at home 
which can disintegrate or throw out of balance any part of our biological, psychological, social, or spiritual health. Such events or ruptures could include an injury, a death, a family crisis, a new assignment at work, or a new supervisor. I'd like to ask you, what ruptures have you faced recently at work or at home? It's clear that more often than not, when people take the time to mention or talk about these ruptures in their lives, they're really asking us, can you heal my story? When employees take the time to talk with coworkers and supervisors about unhealthy work or home life situations, they're not just telling someone about their dis-ease. They're asking others to dialogue in ways to heal their sickness of the soul. They're asking others to help them to construct new ways of interpreting and coping with these unhealthy dilemmas. Yes, it's true that often we are just venting when we talk about our ruptures. But in the process, two things can happen. One, we often learn something from others' perspectives. And two, research evidence now reveals that disclosure of traumatic events is physically beneficial, that communicating actually con contributes to our immune system. Now from this perspective, a curative emphasis in healthy workplaces gives way to an emphasis on caring and spirituality. An organization with a caring emphasis facilitates the change from unhealthy to healthy working conditions. Let me give you an example. A Virginia-based firm, Wampler Foods, offers its employees from packing line to administrative personnel massage therapy. In their words, since instituting a program of massage, job-specific exercises, and ergonomics in 1990, the company has cut repetitive stress injuries by 75 percent. Absenteeism is down too. Research indicates that massage stimulates the brain, the brain's vagus nerve, causing the secretion of food absorption hormones, including insulin. Brainwave measurements revealed that workers who were massaged for 15 minutes twice a week had lower levels of alpha and beta waves, indicating greater alertness and faster and more efficient abilities in solving math problems. A caring organization promotes change and the development of policies which enhance employees' participations. Let me give you another example. The well-known United States real retailer, Walmart, owns a satellite communication system which is connected to every one of its suppliers and to every point of sale in its stores. With this system in place, each and every store employee has immediate access to financial data for decision making and suppliers have point of sale data for cost effective ordering and inventory control. Another organization, WI Gore and Associates, who are manufacturers of outdoor and adventure clothing, structured their organization in the form of a lattice with no departments, no managers, no formal titles. They have eliminated the title employee because it suggests a lower status and instead grant everyone except the president and secretary treasurer the title associate. They are committed to empowering their associates to use their freedom to grow. Further, there are no reserved parking spaces except for customers and for people with disabilities. 
and there is no reserved lunchroom for upper management. Now, caring organizations should also develop programs that consider more than the biological health of employees. They want also to consider employees' personal, social, and spiritual health. The needed workplace transformation has virtually nothing to do with organizational restructuring and just about everything to do with working people making a personal commitment to the search for purpose both on and off the job. Another example, Brazil-based SEMCO genuinely gives power and training to every employee. The workers decide their own hours, pay levels, and travel budgets. And they have the power to evaluate and, if necessary, fire their bosses. Another company, once again, Gore, goes to great lengths to develop collaborative learning relationships for its employees. Each associate has someone in the company who agrees to be his or her sponsor. This person is a mentor who acts as coach and advocate and takes a personal interest in the associate's development. In this way then, performance reviews are done not by the boss, but by compensation teams drawn from workers throughout the associate's work site. The sponsor, as advocate, collects data that documents the associate's contribution to other associates as well as to customers. One of the criteria upon which each associate is evaluated is willingness to guide others' development. Without a doubt, health and health care for the Workforce 2000 must address each employee's quest for a meaningful, healthy, well-balanced, and spiritual life. Along with a caring emphasis, organizations must make a commitment to spirituality as a work ethic, and individuals must embrace spirituality in their relationships with colleagues and co-workers. But what is spirituality? Let's consider a few definitions. Spirituality is the search for what is eternal, meaningful, transcendent in our lives. The spiritual dimension is your core, your center. It's your commitment to your own value system. It draws from the sources that inspire and uplift you. Living life fully and spiritually means being in the moment, living one day at a time, rather than being trapped in the past or in the future. Reaching spiritual awareness results in a loss of self because one realizes that he or she can no longer go on the same path. The path changes. We must surrender to the process and allow another to form. Spirit lives in possibilities. An awareness of spirit can transform the emotions we try to escape into delightful discoveries if we are patient and we are willing to surrender to them. Now defining spirituality may be much less important than actually experiencing it. We catch a glimpse of what spirituality is when we remember when someone was really there for us. Spirituality is experienced most as the tone of someone's presence when we are in his or her company. Spirituality is being all there. So spirituality is really an invisible support that develops interconnections between and among people who discover together that pursuing the mission of the organization is compatible with their own personal beliefs.
Now, what do we have to do to make a commitment to an ethic of spirituality? We have to live a present centeredness. We have to take ownership and responsibility for our actions. We have to invoke non-Western thinking, which means going inside for solutions. We need to engage in what's termed resourcement, which calls for the energy of receptivity, the energy of the listening ear. We also need to utilize appreciative learning. And that's when we engage in appreciative learning where managers attempt to discover, describe, and explain those exceptional moments in which the system functioned well. Those moments when members were enlivened and their competencies and skills were activated. Making a commitment to spirituality and well-being does not translate to spending more money and time on new technology, on additional physical infra infrastructure, or even on client service. Instead, we need to invest in the time to communicate with people at all levels, both horizontally and vertically, and to convince them of the urgency of making a commitment to an ethic of spirituality. Individually and in departments and in teams, we all 